the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Uh, we continue today to talk about uh, the church history, and uh, as we alluded to last time, uh, we spoke about, you know, the, the, the church councils, and you have this period of time between 325 and 781, where the seven ecumenical councils take place, and, you know, the first one refutes and establishes um, the Nicene Creed, and the last one refutes and establishes uh, iconography, having icons, iconophiles, uh, went out over the iconoclasts. So the first one uh, refutes Arianism and this idea that Jesus Christ is not the creator, but rather he is created. The last of the controversies that gets resolved uh, in the last of the councils it basically says that we can also depict him um, and then his beloved saints and that worship and, and uh, goes only to God and that we venerate uh, the one true uh, God and all of his saints uh, giving them a, there's a marked differentiation between veneration and worship so all of these things have now uh, come have now passed and the church is well established now a lot of things are also happening in other parts of the world so I'm gonna kind of go back and forth a little bit geographically to give you an idea of what's happening in the Arabian Peninsula around the time of 600 you have a guy named Hamet who comes into um, the world if you will and he brings a new uh, religion to this Arabian Peninsula he is taught by an, uh, an Aryan leaning priest um, and he kind of gets some of the information uh, incorrect ab about God and his son Jesus Christ so you have uh, the rise of Islam take place and it's going to affect a lot of the world so they're going to they're going to come up with this new religion which is a new religion in the eyes of modern day uh, scholarship but you know at the time it just seemed to be a christian heresy so what was muhammad teaching he was teaching that you know there is only one god and that he doesn't need a son to help to redeem the world Jesus Christ is a prophet in that he was born of a virgin named Miriam um, and he will judge the living and the dead so he will come again he will judge the living and the dead so some of some of uh, his understanding was accurate and some of it wasn't obviously him saying that Jesus was just a prophet is rejected in the in the Orthodox Christian Church uh, but it's uh, accepted amongst is Islam. So he is the last prophet. He is believed to be the guy who uh, also witnessed the Archangel Gabriel. And uh, the Archangel Gabriel spoke to him. The Archangel Gabriel recited uh, the Quran for him. And the Quran becomes the word of God, so to speak. So the word of God is is in a book is in a book um there are things in the quran that that contradict each other a little bit uh for instance you have early on in, in the in the text of the quran muhammad tells his followers to worship towards jerusalem uh later on he's going to change that and say no we worship towards mecca where we do a hajj which is um, which is one of the five pillars of Islam. They go to uh, Mecca to uh, you know have their their uh, their celebration, their year their yearly celebration during uh, the 
and they have uh, the month of Ramadan uh, and so on. So every every Muslim is supposed to go to Mecca to do the Hajj um, at least once in their lifetime if they can afford it. Um, some so, there's interesting things going on there. One of the other things that is happening there with Islam is you have this idea that Abraham had a, had two sons. One was Ishmael, born of Hagar, which is true according to the text of scriptures. Uh, this was his maid servant or his wife's maid servant. Um, Ishmael is um, you know not basically thrown away. He actually is going to be the father of a great peoples. And these happen to be the, the Arabians, the, the people of um, Arabia, so to speak. Um, so this is their father. Like, um, even historically, that's not really debated. Uh, well, in the, the Quran itself, it's understood that Abraham went to sacrifice his son Ishmael. Where? In Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. In that same region where the Jews believe that Abraham went to son, sacrifice his son Isaac at the um, Mount Moriah. So, so this becomes a holy site for Islam. And they are going to, uh, historically, they're going to take over that, peer, that region of the world, <laughs> Jerusalem, um, very soon. And they're going to basically build a uh, building there for Abraham. Okay, this is going to be known as, and currently is built there, and currently exists and stands there. Um, this is going to be known as the, the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock. It's a beautiful, uh, got some gold, it's a gold dome now. Um, and, uh, I think one of the kings of Jordan actually paid for that to happen, uh, a uh, hundred years ago or so. Um, but anyways, this is a, a beautiful building. It's the second holiest site in Islam. And it is there at the place of the temple. Uh, so that's very, very important in our understanding of, um, church history and I'll probably come back to that at some point again now um, so Islam is on the rise Islam has is going to take over large swaths of land I'm going to come up the Arabian Peninsula they're going to take over northern Africa they're going to come into uh, Jerusalem they're going to take that portion of land um, a lot of Syria is eventually going to fall. Um, our, our church of Antioch is kind of influenced, heavily influenced by Islam. Um, rather, they're going to be taken over. The city is going to be heavily influenced by Islam, rather. Um, Damascus is going to be taken over by Islam, uh, Syria. They're, the northern Africa is going to be taken over by Islam. Islam is going to go all the way in to Europe uh, by way of Spain, and um, they're gonna they're gonna infiltrate as much as they can. They're going to do um, to do a lot of of conversion, converting people, conversions. They have a system uh, that um, they work out. Uh, and, you know, you're going to have a lot of different Islamic influences. But for all intents and purposes now, you have the Arabs coming up and, and doing, uh, doing their thing. Baghdad is going to kind of become the center of Islam. And, um, and that will come back into play later on. So uh, the Arabs are going to invent um, algebra. Okay. Um, they're very scientifically based people. They are they who worship the stars, right? Uh, so uh, from the Zoroastrian roots, if you will. So they're going to also, uh, you know, give us a lot of astronomy. So a lot of science-based things. 
they're going to invent the number zero, which is fascinating, because how do you uh, how do you depict the number zero? And even like if you think about what the numeral system that we use currently, it's called the Arabic numerals. Okay, when you actually do mathematics, uh, like Arabic is written um, from right to left. Uh, whereas English is written from left to right, Arabic is written from uh, left to right. Well, mathematically, when you do math, you actually start from left to right. It's uh, um, the way math works. You know, when you have uh, uh, 111, you and you add it to 22, it's 133. Well, what, what? Where did you get that number from? You didn't go from the right to the left. You went from the left to the right. You did three, three, one. Uh, is how you added it together. So mathematics are given to us by um, uh, by Islam. Algebra is given to us by Islam. You know, Father Gabriel. My name in Arabic is Jabra uh, Al Jabra. You see, it's the it means it literally means the strength. Uh, Jabrail, which is my my full name, Gabriel, means the strength of God. So that's mathematics. Um, they're calling it the strength algebra. So even uh, very interesting and unique. So they're going to play a big role in human history, Islam is, and they're going to come into great contention with a lot of the Orthodox Church. They're going to rob uh, the Church of a lot of her people uh, by giving the church by giving the people this um, superficial understanding of who Jesus Christ is. They're going to say he isn't needed. He's a prophet, so you don't have to reject Jesus 100%. You just kind of have to reject the idea that he is divine, that he is God. Um, so some people are okay with that. They're also going to impose a tax system on uh, Christians. They're, Christians and Jews are going to be known by Islam as people of the book. And since they have, um, they have a good relation ship with uh, with Muhammad he was treated well by Christians and Jews um, he said you cannot you know destroy them or kill them or whatnot but you know it's it's your responsibility to bring them into Islam uh, but we, we won't kill them we you know so what did they do they they called them people of the book and they just taxed them a little bit more than than a Muslim would be taxed um, so Christians had financial incentive to convert to Islam. Uh, so they did that in some cases. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, many, in many cases, uh, you know, going back, my family didn't, uh, didn't pay the taxes uh, and stayed Christian. Um, so you have a lot of that going on. That's starting in the year 600. And, uh, and is going to really play a big part in, in human history for about 800 years to maybe another 1,000, 1,400 years. So we'll come back to that in a, in, a, in a little bit. So 600, that all begins uh, with Islam. You also have uh, in the year 800, you have this guy named Charlemagne who is going to come in the Frankish... Uh, Germanic areas okay he's a Frank so he's from France essentially um, he is going to come down into Rome and he's going to claim himself to be the Holy Roman Emperor he's not Roman he's not holy he's certainly not an Emperor he gets crowned Holy Roman Emperor in the year 800 and it really starts to change the posture of the the European world they are going to come to uh, return to their former glory if you will and they're gonna regain their strength the Pope of Rome is going to become a very strong figure over time um, and he's gonna become more and more uh, sh strengthened over the next uh, 600, 800 years, so um, so you have you have the 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 you have that kind of taking place in in uh, in and around Rome. 
you also have in 988, so not too far away. These are three major highlights in three different uh, places. You have a guy named uh, Vladimir who is over in uh, what's modern day Ukraine. And he, he has a, a port uh, on the Dnieper River. And, you know, it's kind of like... Um, it's kind of like an impossible passageway uh, to get through without stopping and paying the toll. So he would stop a whole bunch of ships and would get them to pay the toll and uh, basically built a, a, a city around that and an empire, if you will, that comes out of that. These, these people at the time were known as the Rus people. Um, and so... These are the precursors to what are, what we would have as the, the modern-day Ukrainians and the modern-day Russians, Russians, okay, uh, or Belarusians, all those, all those people. Now, Vladimir is like a barbaric dude, um, has a lot of women, you know, he lives a very um, barbaric lifestyle, so to speak. Well, he is of the mind that he needs to... Um, bring a religion to his people to unite his people together so he goes and sends emissaries all around the world he sends them to uh, synagogues he sends them to uh, the the church in the west he sends them to the church in the east he sends them to the is to the to islam uh, i guess south of him uh, so to speak and um and so they they all kind of his emissaries come back and they they tell him you know what they have observed um and they return with like you know this uh this beautiful uh oration of of um of what it is to that they experienced in all of these different places again this is not to be polemical uh this is a paraphrase of the quote from from uh from history and they basically said that you know when they went to islam uh, they couldn't drink uh so they went to the mosques the people took their shoes off in the mosques um so you know they would have smelly feet um so they didn't like uh their experience in the mosque uh they didn't understand uh the whole the whole but that was basically it uh, is is it was smelly it was um it, they couldn't eat meat they couldn't or they couldn't eat certain meats and then uh they couldn't drink alcohol like they didn't understand that i mean take take uh take alcohol away uh from the Rus people like it just doesn't make any sense um so so they went over to the the jews and they went to the synagogues and uh they didn't like the experience there either and then they told them that all they were doing was weeping that they had lost the temple um that their god dwelt in the temple and then their god uh the temple was destroyed and so he's like i don't understand so their temple was the temple housed god and they go yeah and he goes so their god was defeated <laughs> and uh and they go, I guess, like, in 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 their understanding, he goes, well, if their either their god was defeated or their god abandoned them, either way, um, either way, they can't be the the true tr the the true faith that I would bring my people into. Their god was either defeated or abandoned them. Okay, so that's an interesting uh, interesting conversation they had. So they went to the church in the west, and. Um, they they thought they thought well of it well enough of it um but you know it seemed a little uh, pretentious i guess I, I don't know what the word was in the in this in the in the text um they went to the church in the east which is basically centered in constantinople they uh visited the agia sophia they went into this beautiful edifice that they've never that isn't rivaled anywhere in 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 the world at that time. This is 988, so you know they go. We went there. They brought. I mean, they probably brought out the best of the the, the chanters or the best choir or 
you know, and it was beautiful liturgy um, from the east, and it was probably the emperor was there, and, you know, it was very, very uh, ceremonial and wonderful, but they knew, they said that we did not know whether we were in heaven or whether we were on earth, but we knew that God dwelt there. And plus, his grandmother, Olga, had already embraced this faith of uh, the, the Eastern Church. The, and so, you know, she's already embraced it, so you might as well as well. <laughs> so he thought well of their, um, their report, and he embraced the faith. And then brought all of the people into um, into the Eastern Church. They were baptized. Um, they were baptized in the in the river in the Dnieper the Dnieper River. And then um, you know this is known as the Baptism of Rus uh, in 988. That that date is pretty important uh, historically. Um, notice it's a thousand years after. Um, and it's, they embrace the church of the East. Okay. Not the church in the West. So a few years later, okay. Like 60 some years later, we're going to have another big event that's going to take place. And that is known commonly in the, in the Orthodox church as the Great Schism, or historically speaking, in, as the Great Schism. This is pointed to as uh, 1054, 1054. And what happened then was a guy, there was no Pope in Rome at the time. He, there wasn't a Pope at all in Rome. And what happened was the, 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 there was a cardinal that had come to Constantinople. And his, his name always escapes me, but his last name is Humpert. Um, Humpert. And he, Cardinal Humpert, he, uh, he comes and he basically excommunicates the Orthodox, the, the Orthodox Church of the East, the Church of the East of, in Constantinople from the Church of the West. And what he does is he slaps what's called a papal bull, so like this letter, an official a letter from the Pope, which seemed to be forged, historically speaking, because the, the, there was no Pope in Rome uh, at the time. So he basically slaps this uh, bull of excommunication, citing that the Orthodox Church in the East uh, has done three things differently that cause, that are cause for separation. The first is that the Orthodox priests wear beards. Okay, they have beards. Uh, you know, I have a semi beard with my goatee. Um, you know, Orthodox East beards are like you know a big part of it. Um, the Orthodox in the East, the Church in the East, the priests marry. You know, whereas in the in the Roman Church they are clean shaven. And, um, and they are celibates, okay, which is something that developed in the West uh, exclusively. Uh, so they wouldn't allow their priests to marry and because I, th I think part of it was, uh, was based on, um, you know, having daily masses. Uh, so you really can't have relations with a woman the day before your wife, the day before. Uh, also, maybe part of it was just inheritance and inheritance law, you know, that the priests would uh, uh, give the, their kids their inheritance instead of leaving it to the church kind of thing. Um, so those those maybe are the reasons for that. Um, whatever. Those are two major reasons. But the big one, the big one is this idea called the filioque the filioque and what happened in the filioque 
he claimed that the Orthodox removed the filioque from the Nicene Creed. He claimed that we had removed it. Well, the honest truth of that is, no, they added it to the Nicene Creed in the West. And they did it with good intention, good reason, it seems. Um, and it probably started in Spain to combat some of this Aryan heresy that's still continuing to be propagated in that region. And maybe with Islam pushing up and pushing in as well, you have this idea that Jesus Christ is not equal to the Father, okay? And, you know, and they pointed to the creed and said, see, if the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father only, how can you say that Jesus Christ is equal to him? So they, uh, they said, oh, well, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. In order to combat that heresy, they created another problem theologically. Um, this is going to be addressed in the in the eighth or ninth century by one of our great saints named Saint Photius, who was the patriarch of Constantinople uh, for many years, and it was called the Photian Schism. They kept trying to get him out of there because he was so smart, super intellectual. And basically told the Roman church why the filioque doesn't work theologically. Why you cannot add and the son to the filioque. Uh, nevertheless, it was adopted in Rome after it was adopted in Spain. It made its way into the church in Rome. And now the Orthodox in the East, so to speak, are in 1054, are now being accused of removing it from the creed when in all reality they added it to the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Okay, so what ends up happening is you have, uh, you have like... Uh, a semi-division taking place in the Orthodox uh, Church and uh, the Roman Catholic Church in the West. Now, there was a patriarch in Antioch uh, named Peter, say the second or Peter the third. Um, in 1054, he only was there for like, I don't know, five years he just happened to be the patriarch in 1054. <laughs> and he wrote a letter to the Pope and he said like, hey, you know, we have our priests, they marry, your priests are celibate, not a big deal. We have our priests, they wear beards, your priests are clean shaven, not a big deal. We have, um, we have, we don't have this thing uh, the filioque, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in our creed. I don't know where y'all got it from, but certainly this isn't a reason for us to divide over. That was his idea. Um, well, what ends up happening, historically speaking, is he actually sides, so to speak, unintentionally with Constantinople and because of that he is part of the Eastern churches or the Eastern Church stays part of the Eastern Church uh, Constantinople Antioch Jerusalem Alexandria uh, plus further down the line in history we're gonna see that they're basically gonna be um, really close um, Anyways, plus they're close geographically, uh, but so you have this schism that happens. It's known as the Great Schism. Now, if you remember, historically speaking, what's also happening from the West, and I can't remember exactly what dates they are, but it's around this time, 
you have this movement of where the West is getting its um, getting its swag back. Well, how do they get their their swag back? They gotta they gotta go and get money from certain places. Well, who has the money? Uh, let's go to let's go and reclaim uh, Jerusalem. <laughs> So they reclaimed Jerusalem from Islam a few times. They have, these are known as the Crusades. They uh, in 1204 they uh, get lost, and they make their way to the imperial city called Constantinople, and uh, you know they come as friends and they leave as enemies. They uh, they basically sack the city of Constantinople in the name of God. And leave the city bloodied. Uh, this is known as the sacking of Constantinople in 1204. And this really uh, is bad blood between the Orthodox East and the Roman Catholic West. So this, either 1054 or 1204, are really the two big events that separate the Orthodox East from the Roman Catholic west and um and you know there's there's no way to there's no way to un undo that or unsee it or uh it's part of it now theologically there's going to be some changes beyond the filioque that come in the west that the orthodox east never embrace uh, but perhaps that's a video for another time uh as far as historically speaking the Orthodox Church is now uh, centered, if you will, in Constantinople. Um, you have a lot of Islam influencing these other three churches. Antioch, which is going to move in the 12th century because of the Turks, who are, uh, who are basically Islam, if you will. Uh, they're going to kick them out, if you will, of the Christians out, and they're going to reestablish themselves in Damascus. So the Patriarch of Antioch is now in Damascus and he has been for, I don't know, 800 years, something along those lines. Um, and uh, so that, but that's the same bishop. Um, everyone acknowledges and accepts that, that he's the Bishop of Antioch. And even though he's, he's headquartered, if you will, in Damascus, now known as Syria. Um, so that's, that's what's going on in the Orthodox world or around the world, if you will, if you remember your European history, because Europe is going to really, um, establish itself by getting a lot of this, uh, a lot of this gold, <laughs> they're going to really establish its wealth and, um, and you're going to have a lot of Kings really vying for power, vying for power against the Roman church um, in, in your European frame of mind. The East is still keeping on, keeping on. So the church has still been vibrant up until now. The church is now pushed into the Rus lands and uh, two guys named Cyril and Methodius have now... Uh, invented an alphabet called Cyrillic so that the the people of Rus can now actually read the scriptures uh, and know know the text of the scriptures and read and learn and be enlightened themselves you're also going to have a part of the the what's going on in the world when the Roman church really pushes their their agenda um or really ro whatever that region europe let's just say europe as a whole they're gonna push the the muslims out the, they're gonna be known as the moors they're gonna be pushed out into morocco okay um certainly out of spain so you see in spain it's got a lot of arab influence uh even in architecturally so to speak um and it's it be beautiful for sure but part of pushing the moors out they're they're gonna now be able to um translate 
a lot of the the pre the, those enlightened those those what are they called the Plato Aristotle Socrates um, those Greek philosophers there we go they're gonna be able to translate into their own language from the Arabic back into the Greek and into Spanish um, and Ger uh, German and fr uh, French and English these um, these philosophers and they're real they're gonna push the, the push the Moors out and what's left there you know um, plenty of wisdom philosophically uh, plenty of air uh, astronomical wisdom from the the Arabs centered in Baghdad remember but also maybe and I've heard it I've heard two different ideas here um, that when they sacked uh, Jerusalem that they also got these these philosophers and uh, brought them back um, and this is really what's gonna cause the Enlightenment they're going to start th thinking philosophically, and it's going to enlighten them. And then you're going to have the enlightened despots, those rulers that are, you know, enlightened now. And you're going to go through this huge revival period in the West, in the West. Now, Islam has um, basically devastated the Orthodox Church, except for in in um, in Russia, which is it's flourishing like crazy in, in that region of the world and it's a huge vast empire and you have a lot of this vast empires that are actually now taking form around the world and colonial expansion and so on right all of that is now starting to um take place in the world now what are the what are what's going on with the arabs what's going on with the greeks well they're under the turks who have the turkish empire under a lot of um under a lot of uh their their strength and the turks are going to basically cause the fall of constantinople and you know that great city which has been fortified with the moats and so on like that i told you the theodosian walls which i hope you looked up and uh, and sought uh to to uh, find the information about them you know they found a way to destroy them and basically um get into the city and take it over this was uh the fall of constantinople in 1454 and um and the way that they did that was they got a cannon. Um, they got their hands on the cannon, which was invented by uh, a Christian. And he went to, he initially went to Constantinople, the, to the emperor and said, hey, I have invented this. I'd like to sell it to you exclusively for like, I don't know, let's say a billion dollars. And the, 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 uh, the emperor didn't have a billion dollars to spend on it. He wanted it, but he couldn't afford it. So, you know, it, the empire had declined to, to this point. And, um, and so he goes, he needs a buyer for his product, the cannon. So he goes to Sultan Mehmet, who is the, the, um, the Sultan of uh, overseer of all of the, of all of the Turks and he goes hey I have this cannon I'd love to sell it to you for a billion dollars and he goes if you can get it to me by such and such a date I'll give you four billion dollars like fourfold what he wanted from Constantinople and that was basically the end once they uh, they did their I think it was almost a 60 day siege of the of Constantinople almost gave up but they ended up pushing and persevering and taking over the eastern um the eastern part of the roman empire completely and that put an end to what's known as byzantium okay 
Now, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute here. But, like, you know, so Constantinople falls in 1454. Who is there to replace them? The Turks. The Turks set up a millet system. And in this millet system, they basically put the, the patriarch of Constantinople over all of the other patriarchs in their respective um, uh, uh, empire. Okay, so Jerusalem falls under under Constantinople. Uh, Alexandria falls under Constantinople. Um, Antioch falls under Constantinople. And th why? It's because it's a tax-based system. You know, you, you patriarchs collect the taxes from the Christians and you give the taxes to us, right, is the idea there. Um, and so, you know, Christians are taxed, you know, more than Muslims, basically, is the point. Um, and so, you know, to basically continue this movement towards convert to Islam, um and you won't have to pay taxes because we can't kill you because you're people of the book idea. So, so that's kind of the way that's going, uh, that's taking place, if you will. And, um, and so now Constantinople has fallen and the Orthodox Church, I would say, is kind of like stuck under this system for, man, quite a while. Now, Islam is going to keep making its uh, push into Europe. And by the grace of God, you know, by literally, literally miracle of God, like rain <laughs> fell, like severe thunderstorms and rains. Um, you know, Islam might have penetrated um, Europe much sooner than it is now. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, they, they actually in Vienna were able to uh, withstand their attacks um, when uh, when 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 the Turks came up. Now, eventually, the Turkish Empire, as uh, we know it, is going to start to uh, get pushed back against. So, what's going to happen is in I believe 1821, if I'm not mistaken, the the Greeks are going to fight for their independence um, from the Turks, and they're going to win on March 25th, um, which is Annunciation. So that's going to be their Greek Independence Day uh, from the Turks, which is going to be uh, celebrated to this day on the, the great feast of Annunciation. Um, this was prophesied, by the way. Uh, by uh, Saint Cosmos of Ayatolia, he said it was when it was a double feast. It actually was the day that it was Pascha and Annunciation <laughs> that year uh, that they would get their independence from the Turks, and that's what happened, uh, which is really um, really fascinating. So, um, so the 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 Greeks are going to get their independence uh, from the Turks. But Constantinople isn't going to go back to, um, to the Greeks, so to speak. It's still going to be under the Turks. And the patriarch of Constantinople is still going to basically be influenced, so to speak, by the law of, 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 of the Turks, so to speak. Um, so, but so what's going on in the world, right? Well... If you remember your history again, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, right? So he comes and he discovers the new world and people are starting to migrate over there from uh, Europe, not, not from under the Turks. They're migrating there from Europe, from Europe, <laughs> Um so that's taking place in, in, in the West. So those people from the West are starting to migrate to uh, the New World, America, to establish themselves, uh, reestablish themselves. Why? Uh, they were tired. Some of them were tired of this, this 
weirdness going on in their churches. Um, you know, you had this, uh, the Anglican church kind of spring up uh, because King Henry VIII wanted a fourth wife or something like that, and the Pope refused it. So he, you know, did away with the Pope and made himself the head of the church, of the Anglican church. Um, you had this movement with uh, Martin Luther. <coughs> Martin Luther had 95 ideas where the Roman church was wrong, and uh, they were called the 95 Theses. He put them on the Wittenberg um, Cathedral, and uh, he nailed them there, and he wanted to debate. The church wouldn't have any of that open debate, and, um, you know, Lutheranism was, was born, and the Protestant uh, Reformation was underway, and, uh, you know, because you had this new, new invention called the printing press, and now people could uh, print uh, the 95 Theses and read them, and uh, they agreed with Martin Luther, so you had a lot of people basically defecting from, from the Roman Catholic Church and becoming, um, becoming Protestants, so they were protesting um, what the Roman Catholic Church was doing, and, you know, you had uh, all these different characters, um, Zwingli and, uh, and uh, Calvinism with John Calvin and so on, and all these different uh, branches of Protestantism kind of springing up, and the, they, you know, were somewhat persecuted, if you will, for being Protestants or, you know, not being certain Protestant in certain regions. So where did they go? They went to the New World uh, and established themselves where they could have religious freedom. You remember the pilgrims, um, they, they wanted to, you know, worship a certain way against uh, differently than the Anglican church or something along those lines. So a lot of people coming from Europe, coming to the New World and establishing themselves, uh, they're not coming from the Middle East, they're not coming from the Turkish lands, uh, that to me tells you that the Turks were relatively peaceful people um, and, you know, gave them, you know, continued to allow them to have jobs, but they had to pay higher taxes. So they bore the higher taxes and they lived amongst the Turks. Um, that's not always going to be the case. Okay, historically speaking, that's not going to always be the case. It's going to change relatively soon. Uh, but for, for now... Um, that's what's going on there. Now, what's happening in, in Rus? Well, eventually, you have, uh, you have uh, a dynasty that's going to start in the, six, I think, 1600s, um, known as the, the Romanov dynasty. I might be wrong on the start date on that. But, you know, you have uh, a movement in, Ru in the Rus lands towards the west. Um, so St. Petersburg is basically, um, built, uh, by, uh, Tsar Peter, uh, the Great. He ends up, uh, putting St. Petersburg, you know, if you look at, uh, where it is geographically, it's over by Finland and Sweden, um, in that region. So it's as close to <laughs> the West as you could possibly get. It's got Western architecture, uh, so there's this movement to westernize the Orthodox Church in the Rus lands without, without rejecting Orthodoxy. So you still have an uh, eight-toned system, musically speaking. You have, uh, but, you, but you have like four-part choirs, four-part harmony and, and, uh, and uh, that kind of thing going on. And the, the Rus people are, uh, have embraced orthodoxy pretty well, but there's an intellectual class called the intelligentsia that is, um, you know, pushing back against this dynasty and using all kinds of propaganda to undermine the czarist rule. Um, they, then some guy tries to kill the czar and, and, and actually does it. And um, I think uh, Princess Elizabeth or Queen Elizabeth, uh, she ends up uh, 
you know, going and visiting this guy and saying, why, why did you kill my husband? He goes, I was just trying to, you know, I was just trying to, uh, you know, give you life. She's like, you didn't give me life. You, when you killed my husband, you, you killed me. And then she was uh, eventually became a, mon, a nun and uh, a monastic and then uh, was uh, some, soon executed by being thrown down a well um, by the Bolsheviks after the Bolshevik Revolution. So in, uh, if you remember all of, all of your, your world history, um, and I know I'm going really fast through history, but like, and there's a lot going on here. Um, what am I trying to say? Uh, that that orthodoxy keeps on keeping on. R Rus, the Rus people have kept the orthodoxy going. They even claim to be the third Rome. So Rome defected because of heresy. They uh, then Constantinople fell because of the invasion. And but but the Rus, the Russian Church, it will never fall. It is the third Rome, and it'll never fall. Well, eventually they fall to communism, and that's going to become a big problem uh, for. For uh, for world orthodoxy for sure. <coughs> so what do we have? Um, I think I've talked about all the regions pretty well. Uh, Europe is now in this colonial expansion uh, with their kings and doing all their thing, but there's movement against the kings, uh, and we're moving. We're all heading towards. Uh, the war to end all wars in 1914 through 1917 um, you have the first world war okay and after the first world war all of the empires of the world are going to collapse they're going to collapse and you're you're basically going to be left with these nation states and uh, United States is now going to be really uh, preeminent in all of that. People are going to be moving here pretty, pretty rapidly and with rapid expansion because um, it provided new opportunity and so on. Um, so what's happening in the world or orthodoxy? Well, it, but still under until that happens, the Arabs are not coming here. Well, in 1860, roughly. Uh, the, the Turks have now, bec they're, they're going through what's a period of, um, genocide is kind of the best way I can put it. They're, they kill a whole bunch of Greeks. They kill a whole bunch of Armenians and they, they are, you know, killing a bunch of Arabs too. The, the people of Syria the, in Damascus specifically, they're going to be um, uh, hunted down by the Turks. And so they're going to flee for their lives. Uh, many of them are going to go to Beirut uh, in, to basically preserve their lives. Uh, many of them are going to die, uh, including a beloved saint of the church named St. Joseph of Damascus, he is going to be the, par the, the spiritual father of the parents of St. Raphael of Brooklyn. So Raphael of Brooklyn was in, the mo in his mother's womb as they fled for their lives, leaving Damascus, Syria, and going to uh, Beirut, where now Lebanon, okay? And he's born in, in Beirut. Um, after things die down um, and they come back seeing their church completely devastated, destroyed, They St. Raphael's parents helped to rebuild the church in Damascus. And they raise a guy who uh, becomes a saint uh, in the church, but, but more so, um, more so, but like before he becomes a saint, how does he become a saint? He actually, uh, goes through a whole lot of, uh, problems, um, that, that really, that, you know, he is privy to because he's like this, uh, Greek educated Arab speaker. <laughs> 
um, and so he's 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 educated and uh, very very intellectual, um, and so he knows a lot about the the history of the Greeks. He knows a lot about the history of the Turks. He knows a lot about the history of the Arabs, how they all kind of work together or work against each other. So he looked at how the the Orthodox Church under the Turkish uh, oppression, if you will, uh, you know, how they all kind of came under the, the, the Sultan and how that all worked. And some of the church, historically, in Antioch especially, um, you know, they basically uh, defected to Rome. And they did so because Rome, you remember, they're coming into the Holy Land and they're wanting to Christianize uh, the Christians and make them Latins or, you know, make them more like them. And the Christians would have very little to do with that. Or, or some said, hey, they're teaching our kids. What are you doing for us uh, being under the Turks? And so the Turks weren't educating them, but the Latins were, so to speak. So what ends up happening in like 1724 is one of our, one of our Antiochian bishops, Greek Orthodox bishop, um, decides to unite with Rome, unite with Rome. And there's a lot of these things that happen around the world, um, in uh, other parts of the world. I'm just focusing on the Arab part, uh, but there's the Udiots uh, that also are part of this kind of same substructure where the Roman church is basically has an outsized influence financially and they're going to do their best to take as many people and bring them under Rome as possible. Uh, even though they're historically Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox lands, and uh, they geographically should not be penetrated by the the West um, and the Roman or the Roman Catholic Church of the West, so to speak. And so, but anyways, they do that. This is known as the Melkite Schism in 1724. So the 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 churches that are in this country, so to speak, that are known as Melkites, are you know basically have everything about them that's Orthodox in form and theology. Most for the most part, uh, but they united with Rome in 1724, and uh, and the Patriarch of Constantinople protested and said, "You can't do that." So he put a Greek bishop, a Greek-speaking bishop, over the Greek Orthodox Church in in Antioch. And that Greek guy is basically over the church for 175 years, from 1724 to 1898, 1899. And part of the argument that St. Raphael makes is that that's not okay. The same thing happens in Jerusalem. And uh, that guy is a Greek speaker. Um, I, I, I just can't tell you about Alexandria. I'm not really too sure about the church but uh, i believe that's the case also there but but um but the the two churches jerusalem and and antioch which i've done a lot of studies on they they both come under greek speaking um uh, bishops and the 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 brotherhood of the holy sepulcher in jerusalem you know you can only have a patriarch from the Greek that speaks Greek, that's basically Greek, okay? Um, it, it, you know, that ha that happens historically in time. And so the Greek Orthodox Church of Antioch, it seems to me, and I can't prove it, okay? Uh, but it correlates with when St. Raphael was in Russia and he complained, he got kicked out of Antioch because he complained that one of the patriarchs uh, practiced some some simony, okay, and basically bought his seat into 
into uh, the patriarchate, and um, and because of that, he was um, basically sent into exile to Russia, uh, where he is uh, uh, basically uh, spent a good bit of his time uh, deep into Russia, and um, probably had the ear to some degree of Tsar Nicholas II, uh, because we know that Saint Nick Saint Raphael of Brooklyn um, received his pay from the Tsar. Um, and we know that he actually, when he, he was sent, uh, to America to basically be the, the lone priest for all of the, uh, the people of New York, but all of the people of America. So he's the only Arabic speaking priest and he was sent by, by the Russians to America uh, that are still um, that are still under uh, Czar the Czar at the time, and uh, he comes here in 1895, um, and uh, he comes with other Russians um, via uh, 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 I believe Europe. He comes uh, I think from England, if I'm not mistaken. He traverses all of Russia, comes over to England, comes on gets on a ship and comes to America. Um, the rest of his party, uh, you know, I think he had his own deacon with him, but um, the rest of his party continued on to uh, to San Francisco, uh, where uh, they were establishing the church from, you know, Alaska and so on. Uh, the Russians were, since Alaska was part of uh, Russia at the time. Um, eventually gets bought by America. And uh, anyways, the 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 saint raphael of brooklyn comes to america in 1895 um he stays here the whole time he dies in 1915 during world war one he dies okay uh, we believe it was a heart attack if i'm not mistaken and uh and he in his time here uh he gets consecrated a bishop He's the, he's the first bishop actually uh, consecrated on U.S. soil. Um, he is the, the Arabic-speaking bishop, but he also knows Greek because of his, his uh, formation as a kid. He also speaks Russian uh, because of his, you know, he spent time there after he protested against the Patriarch of, of Antioch. Um, in 1899, the, the Church of Antioch uh, is given back over to Arab speaking bishops. So the ed, ends the, the, the Greek speaking reign over the church in Antioch. The same thing does not happen for Jerusalem, though I believe uh, that St. Raphael would, uh, uh, was probably working the, the czar over. I can't prove it again. Uh, to bring him into to bring the uh, the Russians more into control over over Jerusalem to basically give the Arabs back control over Jerusalem as well can't prove that so it never happened at least up until today it hasn't happened um, so so there you go um, so Zar so Saint Raphael comes to America he establishes 30 churches in this country, uh, crisscrossing across America. I think he goes to Mexico once. He goes up to Canada as well and uh, makes a whole bunch of trips uh, uh, and uh, baptizes and marries people off. He, he then, as a bishop, his first, uh, the first guy he ordains a priest is a, a priest named Father Nicola Yanni. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, movement, maybe towards uh, uh, telling his story. He died of the Spanish flu um, during the 1918-1919 Spanish flu epidemic, and uh, and then uh, Father Nicola Yanni becomes, uh, you know, goes and crisscrosses the way he saw his spiritual father crisscross across the mid mid uh, middle America. Um, and, uh, you know, basically take care of a whole bunch of people in, in that, in that region. But, um, 
he was based out of Kurdy, Nebraska. Okay, so our people came to America, the Arabs did, and they basically were peddlers, and they basically uh, were in the cities, go into cities, get the, the goods, and then peddle them out to the countryside and sell them to the people in the countryside, and uh, um, that's how they made their living. They did relatively well for themselves. Um, they got here at the right time, uh, put their kids through education, and, uh, and then you have, like, you know, the war that happened in, in 1914 to 1917, then the pandemic that happened in 18 and 19, um, then the roaring 20s where, you know, everything was was uh, was going good. Then you have a, a Great Depression uh, followed by World War II. So uh, that's, again, his, historically what's going on. What are our churches here in America doing? Uh, we're, we're establishing ourselves. Notice, though, uh, our Protestant brethren had gotten here much sooner. Our Roman Catholic brethren from Europe have, had gotten here much sooner. So now we're establishing ourselves on ethnic lines. And so we, we have Arab churches, we have Greek churches, we have Russian churches. Well, the Russian people have now, um, have have basically uh, abandoned Christianity after, uh, you know, the Bolshevik Revolution after World War I, and they're going to fall into their dark ages uh, and basically embrace communism over there for 70 years. And the communism is going to destroy the, the Orthodox Church uh, in, in Russia but they're gonna, there's going to be pockets of people that are going to continue to be faithful um, throughout that. There's going to be monasteries that are going to be destroyed, churches that are going to be destroyed, blown up. And, um, you know, it was illegal to be a Christian and people would be baptizing their, their kids secretly. Uh, but many, uh, you know, many, many priests die uh, not willing to give up their faith, including um, the patriarch. Uh, Tikhon of Moscow, who was here in America, <laughs> um, establishing uh, churches here himself, had Bishop uh, Raphael under him, and uh, Bishop Raphael was under the Russians, so the Arabs were under the Russians for that 20-year period. Well, everything's going crazy around the world with the war, and then, then Russia falls, and so we have a uh, Half of the Arabs want to stay under under the Russian uh, Omophorian, the the bishop's uh, stole, right? Um, and the other half of the Arabs are going to say, no, we need to be under Antioch. That's our mother church. So what happens is there's a a, a Rusi and Taki split in the in the church in America, uh, where half of them want to be under Russia, half of them want to be under Antioch. Then eventually kind of they all go under Antioch because Russia's Russia is theologically bankrupt at this point so you can't really unite with them uh, you know there are arch enemy so to speak you have uh, you know as far as America goes so the the Arabs embrace Antioch again um, but the the Rusi Antaki split ends up being a, a New York Toledo split. So there's two bishops that were um, uh, consecrated bishops at the same time, and you had to pick a side as to which bishop you were going to be under, and uh, and so that happened. Um, Metropolitan Philip uh, of uh, blessed memory, thrice blessed memory. He um, he is going to eventually unite the archdiocese in America under his omophorian uh, of the Antiochian church. So all the Arab speaking churches, so to speak. And also that in the eighties, he's going to bring in um, a whole host of uh, what's known as the evangelical Orthodox churches. Uh, there, it's this uh, conglomeration, if you will, of, um, of Protestant evangelical Christians who decided that they needed to reestablish the the church. They looked to the east and the west. They discovered that the Orthodox East were faithful uh, to the scriptures, 
and that they, they rediscovered a lot of the early church writings post-Bible. Um, so like Clement and, uh, and uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, uh, Polycarp, uh, the Didache, they, they rediscovered a lot of these uh, 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 articles and documents, and they really started to reestablish themselves as Orthodox, uh, but they never had a bishop, so they uh, they came under under uh, Bishop Metropolitan uh, Philip in the eighties. It was a great um, a great uh, uh, influx of uh, evangelical Orthodox into the church. Uh, many of their churches are very now well established uh, for the last 30, 40 years, and uh, and uh, and they came into the church. So, so Metropolitan Philip did a lot of uh, uh, growing the church um, in many ways, but he also established really early on in his uh, in his uh, bishopric, he established the Antiochian village, which has helped produce a whole lot of priests um since then we've branched off and had like six or seven regional maybe 10 regional uh camp uh programs um in the our archdiocese uh, bishop uh, from the we, we also established a lot more churches um oh, and missions over the last uh, the last 50 years or so so we, we've grown quite a bit as uh, as an archdiocese and uh, the archdiocese is now comprised of close to 300 uh, churches and missions. And uh, we have uh, about in 2014, we had uh, Metropolitan Joseph uh, come in to uh, be our Metropolitan after Metropolitan Philip uh, reposed of the Lord. And Metropolitan Joseph has continued to grow the, the archdiocese. Um, and administer it as well as possible. Uh, there are several more bishops in our archdiocese, uh, so we we fall here in Atlanta under the geographical um, diocese of uh, the diocese of Miami and the southeast are known as Domsey, um, and so we we fall under uh, currently under a bishop uh, Nicholas. Uh, who's our bishop, and uh, and then uh, we have other bishops. Uh, as of this taping, uh, we have uh, Bishop Basil, um, who's uh, fixing to retire. He's oversees uh, the diocese of uh, Wichita in Mid America. You have uh, Bishop Anthony. He oversees the diocese of Toledo and uh, the Midwest. You have uh, Bishop Thomas. Who oversees uh, the diocese of Oakland and uh, and like Pens Pennsylvania, I think, in the eastern region in diocese. Uh, Bishop John, who oversees our Western Rite churches as well as Boston and are uh, the New England region uh, of the country. And, and uh, we have Bishop Alexander, who oversees uh, Canada. And uh, we have um, Metropolitan Joseph, who oversees uh, New York. Washington D.C. that eastern region again, um, and that diocese, and also he he oversees the west, so California and Oregon, and all the way up to and also the Alaskan diocese. Um, so there's there's I think ten dioceses in our in our archdiocese, and uh, and they're overseen by uh, the the different uh, bishops. And the bishops, uh, the bishops do their best to visit their churches once a year, maybe twice a year, um, and uh, and you know, uh, come and, and edify the people. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of diocese retreats uh, nowadays. We have camping programs for the youth. Um, we have a, a good Sunday school curriculum uh, that's been been pretty well established. Most of the churches have converted. Uh, to English speaking uh, exclusively, uh, some will continue to do Arabic. Um, some are also doing some Spanish, uh, depending on the region of the country. We do mostly English, 
a little bit of with a little bit of Arabic sprinkled in. Our parish here was established in 1921, and uh, and so we're uh, we we just missed the Saint Raphael um, establishing us, um, but you know definitely has uh, has seen a, a lot of different things over the last hundred years. Uh, mostly made up of and comprised of Syrian and Lebanese uh, immigrants at the time. Um, now is comprised of probably a, a half half Middle Eastern uh, descendants uh, and or uh, and half American or you know non non uh, not exclusively coming from an or uh, Orthodox country um, is probably the comp comp composition of our parish here in atlanta georgia uh nevertheless i mean we we this is kind of the the story about uh about christian christianity how we got to be here in atlanta georgia um i am the presiding priest uh what, what's known as the proistamidos of saint uh elias here in atlanta um and uh, you know i've been here for several years now god willing i'll continue to be here for several years my immediate predecessor was Father Michael Evans, who is an archivandrite. I'll talk to you guys more about that in the near future. Uh, but uh, Father Michael did a lot to uh, establish uh, the new building of the church uh, to, you know, uh, build this uh, magnificent hall, a magnificent office space, and Sunday school classrooms. Uh, did a tremendous amount of work with regards uh, to to the church over the last 15 years uh, those are the physical manifestations that he had uh, done as well as many of the spiritual uh, benefits that he has bestowed upon uh, the 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 multitudes of the parishioners that have been here um, you know I have uh, with me uh, currently father George uh, who is retired and um, and detached um, he comes from uh, the from Jerusalem Patriarchate uh, and then came to Antioch maybe 20, 20 years ago here in America uh, by way of New York. Uh, spent spent uh, time in two different parishes there and then retired here to Atlanta. Uh, and uh, we also have Father Habib currently and he is, uh, he is uh, a, a working priest. He works full-time job outside of the church and um, and he is a, uh, uh, a, a wonderful guy. Um, he came from Praoria, Illinois. Pre pre previously, before that, he came from Lebanon. And um, he's been with me uh, for a while now. And I have two deacons, uh, Deacon Simeon and Deacon Daniel. And, uh, you know, they've been here uh, for... Uh, while as well as deacons i believe they've been here for five or six years each um so uh, it's a many many blessings uh, in this community we have a wonderful chanters and uh, uh, just a really nice good vibrant church as i'm sure you see uh, and and we're just thankful we we keep uh we'll keep doing the the work of the church because the church is still a living body uh it it still is alive and well and it, you know Christ said to us the gates of hell will not prevail against the church and so far uh, and a lot of hell has done a lot of uh, work against the church so far uh, we see that the Orthodox Church has preserved uh, what it has been given and we continue on to continue on uh, Father Boniface, of uh, my beloved pastor uh, from St. Philip, used to always tell me and remind me, you know, Father, you just keep the faith. Just keep the faith. And with that, I will uh, meet you all next time. We will talk about the calendar, how we actually keep the faith. God bless you. See you next time.